I could not be more excited to introduce this next session. We have a fireside chat that's being hosted by David Bailey, who's the CEO of BTC Inc. And this guest is an incredible champion of freedom. I have to admit, I've kind of been fangirling backstage. I'm not gonna lie about it. But this man, his revelations changed the world as we know it. He exposed terrible atrocities uh, being perpetrated by the government. He sparked an entire movement and he put his life on the line in the process. Can you please give a huge round of applause to Edward Snowden? This is an audio check. Can everyone hear me all right? C yeah, we can, yeah hear we can hear you. We can hear you. All right. All right. <laughs> cool. Cool. So, Edward, so it's, Edward it's, it's great, it's to, great get to, to get to talk to you. you. What is the role of privacy in society, and, and why do we need it? Yeah, I mean, this is one of those, those questions that we constantly struggle with. It, it's funny because we, we just saw Eric Voorhees on stage. Um, and then, you know, he, he, he ran Shapeshift uh, for a long time, which was a very useful service, right? Uh, it allowed you to go from, from one chain to another chain, right? From, from one token to another. Uh, and it was free, like, in, in terms of uh, identification. We were able to just uh, openly transact. And then uh, they completely changed their business model because they got, as I understand it, a demand letter from the government saying, if you don't start monitoring all of your customers, if you don't start collecting passports, if you don't start storing all of this stuff, uh, for our benefit, uh, we're gonna charge you, prosecute you, shut down your business, yank your license. I'm not sure, ask Eric, you'll be around, I guess. Uh, and go from there. But the, the whole thing is, all right, so this is the status quo. Um, this is the way that, that banking works. Uh, this is the way that, that uh, sorry, I'm getting some uh, indications from, from back of stage. Uh, you guys want me to max it out. Um, but I've got my audio up at 11, so I'm not sure uh, where our audio channels are coming from. Uh, but just to, uh, to, to reiterate quickly there. Today, uh, you're allowed freedom of speech in some measure online. Uh, you know, you can say what you want, and the worst case that you'll get um, is you're going to get kicked off of YouTube, you're going to get kicked off of Twitter, you're going to get deplatformed, right? Uh, which is, this is uh, a big level of interference, but it's happening from the efforts of private companies rather than governments. Now, when it comes to trade, uh, we can't do the same thing where we send money. Uh, we can't trade, we can't exchange, uh, we can't interact with each other in the same way. Um, and this is what I think, for, for me, is the most interesting point uh, uh, about Bitcoin. And I, I've said this before. Bitcoin is, is free money, right? And, and I don't mean that like the price is rising. Um, uh, really, I, I don't mean that like the price is rising. This is not financial advice. You guys have heard it. Uh, things, things are going up really parabolic right now. But what I mean is it's the first free money. Right? Um, you are able to exchange and interact permissionlessly. And when I think about privacy, when I think about liberty, uh, that's what this is all about. What, what does liberty mean? It's freedom from permission. Uh, it means we live our lives in a way that we can experiment, we can engage, we can try things, we can uh, even fail. And we don't have to get, you know, a, a permission slip from the principal's office. Uh, we are not watched. We're not recorded. And because of this, our mistakes don't haunt us. And this, this core point, right, uh, this ability to act without permission, so long as you're not harming someone else, um, so long as you're not infringing on the rights of others, uh, this is the foundation of all rights. Um, when you talk about due process, when you talk about freedom of speech, when you talk about freedom of religion, uh, whatever, whatever you have, right? Um, the, the right to a fair trial, the reason uh, we have these rights, what, what they are recognizing, what they are codifying, is a right to the self, right? Um, and this goes in our language all the way down to private property, right? Privacy is that thing that says you belong to you, rather than to society. Um, and what I fear is that over the last decades, uh, as technology has changed the world in ways that make um, monitoring people 
and peoples at scale, right? Populations seeing everything that's going on um, in new ways and deeper ways, right? Uh, it used to be if, if governments wanted to watch us, uh, they had to put teams of men on the street uh, to follow you around, uh, working in buildings, you know, in cars, out on foot, uh, to see where you go, to see who you meet, uh, how you got there, how long you were there, to sit close enough into the cafe uh, to know generally um, what your activities were, but not so close that you go, who is this guy that's sitting behind me all the time, right? Now, all of this happens with devices that we ourselves paid for, right? Whether it's your home internet connection, whether it's the phone that's in your pocket right now, we are padding out a permanent record of every private life. And once we do that, um, privacy stops being the, the status quo, right? Uh, liberty stops being the natural state of things. Uh, and, and now it's a point in tension uh, with the systems of the day. And, and what does that actually boil down to, right? What does that actually mean? Um, I mean, privacy has always been the natural state of human existence. Because even if you lived back in an old village in the day, uh, people would gossip about you, people would understand you, people would see kind of how you go, how you live. Um, but it was very easy to get away from this. <laughs> you know, you walked out in the woods, uh, you were alone, you closed your doors and there was no one but you. Um, unless they came in and ransacked your journals, uh, these things belong to you. But now, now that there is a record of everything being created, of every message you've ever sent, every border you've ever crossed, everything you've ever bought, every conversation you've ever had, everything you've ever taught, typed into that search box, right? Instead, uh, the only real control uh, we have over the measure of privacy, over the measure of liberty in our lives, in our countries, in our world today, um, is that that governments and institutions, meaning both uh, governmental and corporate decide to grant us because what we really have now is a record of all of our lives uh, that the telecommunications companies have, that, that Facebook has, that the government has, that Visa and MasterCard have, right? And simply their willingness uh, or their agreement with us that they will not read it except where the law permits it, <laughs> except when they choose to break that. Um, and when it's simply too expensive and too difficult. But the whole thing about too expensive, too difficult, just over the span of my life, just over the span of the last few years, we've all seen uh, that difficulty dropping and dropping and dropping. And as we get better uh, deep learning, machine learning, and artificial intelligence uh, methods of sorting through big data, uh, eventually it's gonna be cheap, it's gonna be easy, it's gonna happen on the fly, and so what then, right? So when you ask, why does privacy matter? Right? And we scope back from all of this of what's happening now and how does it work um, into what it means. Um, surveillance, you know, everybody thinks about 2013 and why I came forward and they think surveillance, surveillance, surveillance. 2013 wasn't about surveillance. Surveillance was the mechanism uh, used to discuss a conversation that was affecting all of us, which is that our governments, even in what we like to believe are free and open societies, are becoming increasingly comfortable making decisions without involving the democratic process, right? We weren't asked uh, if we wanted to vote in favor of mass surveillance, right? Uh, they simply did it, right? We weren't asked, the courts weren't even allowed to consider if these systems were constitutional. Every time someone got evidence that they were spied on over these, and this is about happening uh, back to 2004, right before 2013 came forward, uh, there were indications that this system had been built and that it was operating unlawfully. And we got some of the biggest uh, NGOs in the United States who challenged it. Um, we got the American Civil Liberties Union who challenged this in court. They were representing uh, Amnesty International, right? And when it got all the way up to the Supreme Court, right? They said, look, this is a really interesting controversy, and this is something that we should be able to weigh in on. But the government, and by this they mean the executive branch, is saying this is a secret. And because it's a secret, the courts don't have uh, the place to decide this, because it's not for the courts to decide what is or is not secret. It's up to the courts to decide what is or is not lawful. The champion of secrets, right, the master of the keys, that's the executive branch. And they say it's secret, so we have to trust them. 
but that puts society in a position where we have to trust the executive. And if we don't know what the executive is doing, we don't know how to vote. And if we can't vote in a meaningful, informed way, we can't grant consent in a meaningful way, which means even though we have a democracy in name, it's not truly meaningful. And I know this is a long ramble and it's not really what you asked for, but <laughs> this, is beautiful. This, this is where we get back to that, that key point of why privacy matters, is without privacy, uh, we have no power because it's privacy that gives us agency. It's privacy, that right to the self, that allows us to come up with that original idea that could be a bad idea, that could be one we're criticized for, that could get you know, us disowned by our friends or our community or society, right? But then once we have that idea, we can share it with people that we do trust and go, is this a good idea? What do you think about this? And they can sharpen that idea. They can challenge us. They can argue with us. And then we share it again and we share it again. And what, step by step, it goes more broadly out into the world. And once it's gone these extra steps, right, um, suddenly you no longer have a person talking about this. You no longer have a table talking about this. Uh, you have a city talking about it. And then you have a country talking about it. And then you have the whole world talking about it. And that is the origin of progress. Without privacy, you don't have progress. Without privacy, we don't have any meaning in the rest of our rights. Because what is a right? A right exists to protect, not the majority, because the majority decides what is or is not lawful. The majority doesn't need rights. The majority hardly needs laws. Rights exist to protect the minority against the majority. And there is no more vulnerable minority than the minority of them. That was a great answer. And uh, I'm gonna just jump along on my questions because I feel like that encapsulated a lot of, a lot of stuff. So your, your story, I think, is one that showcases that governments don't want to give up the, the power to permission. Um, and so Bitcoin is, is a challenge to that. How do they attack Bitcoin? How do they stop Bitcoin? What should this community be, be looking for uh, from, from governments around the world that are not happy with it? Well, right now, again, uh, the, the panelists we just had, um, uh, anybody who's worked in uh, the cryptocurrency space on the institutional side um, can tell you that the first thing government goes after uh, is privacy, right? Um, what they go is, all right, you can have your magic internet and the money. You can do whatever you want. Um, as long as it fits our status quo, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, you might be a uh, square peg, but you're going to have to find a way to shave enough off of your system to fit into our round hole. Uh, and the problem is the thing that they're being shaving off of Bitcoin um, and the sh thing that they've been shaving off of all of these institutions that are involved in this space are the protections for the people who are using them, right? Uh, they are shaving off the digital equivalent of, of our rights, right? Our, our freedom from unreasonable search, uh, seizure, interference uh, in our private interactions. And this is what I think is the most important thing that, that Bitcoin is missing right now. Right. All of the Bitcoin developers, you hear them talking about it. We've had panels, I, I think, yesterday at your conference, actually, where they talk about the privacy problem and where it's going. And, and here's the thing. Um, the lack of privacy is an existential threat to Bitcoin. And it's an existential threat to the cryptocurrency space broadly. <laughs> Thanks. Um, the reason why uh, is the privacy is the only protection that Bitcoin has for the users of it, the people engaged in the ecosystem to protect them from changes uh, in the political winds of whatever jurisdiction they happen to live in. And you might be in the United States right now and go, look, you know, I'm a fan of government or I'm not a fan of government, whatever. Uh, I'm not worried about this. I've got my passport, right? I've, I've got my uh, bank statements. I've got everything. I can, you know, give a blood sample or, or whatever it is that the, the exchanges are asking for today. Uh, and then I can go about my business, right? You know, it's worse every year. But here's the thing about privacy that people forget. If one of you gives it up, because you go, it's not useful for me, uh, you're taking it away from everybody else who doesn't have uh, that level of comfort, right? Who doesn't have that privilege to go, look, privacy is meaningless to me. Because they live in China, or they live in Russia, or they live in Iran, or they live in Venezuela, right? Um, where they're very much in a more vulnerable position, or they could be tomorrow, because the laws change every day, right? And this is the thing about privacy that I, I think so many of us today have forgotten. 
um, and, and why it, it is so important to defend this is it doesn't matter if you have nothing to hide because privacy isn't about something to hide. Privacy is about something to protect. Right? And the thing that you're protecting is a free and open society. The thing that you're protecting is the right to act and to do and to try and to be different. Right? Because that's what privacy protects. It protects the different people. It protects the transaction that doesn't match all the other ones. Right? And you know, people will make good arguments here and they'll go, look, uh, there are criminals who use Bitcoin. Right? And they're right. They're right. There are criminals out there who use Bitcoin. There's a hell of a lot more criminals who use the dollar. Right? Uh, but there are ones. But there are criminals who are using it. Right? And they're serious criminals and they're people that we don't want uh, basically preying on society. But here's the thing, no amount of chain analysis going out there and going, all right, Bitcoin is providing at least pseudonymity, even if it's not providing anonymity. Uh, and we're gonna go, uh, this Bitcoin uh, transaction from you know, wherever, this old, old TXID, you know, we, we, we pull it out of the muck and we dust it out and then we go, it connects to this one and 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 then finally went to Coinbase. And luckily Coinbase is our little deputy. So let's go to Coinbase and let's go, you know, whose name is attached to that. But the thing is the coin could have been spent 25 times by then. But now you're asking questions, or you're being asked questions. You're going to have to defend this, and you're going to have to go through, you know, where did you get this, and where did you get it from that person? And eventually you're going to have to say, I don't know, and that's going to be suspicious. And if you actually look at the terms of services, uh, terms of service for these major exchanges, uh, when they go into their uh, know your customer policies, right, and their anti-money laundering regulations, uh, where they go, you have to do all of this stuff. And, and by the way, in every case, they go far beyond what the law requires. Um, because they just want to cover themselves. Uh, if you fail uh, to meet whatever arbitrary burden uh, they impose on you, uh, they don't close your account and return your money. They close your account and keep you, right? And, and so this is the thing that I, I think people need to think about, is what government goes after today and will always go after in these spaces uh, are the on and off ramps, right? Uh, they are the points where uh, you either need to buy this uh, or you need to sell this because you want to sell or you want to, you know, buy groceries. And at least now, you know, they're, they're not taking that so very frequently, you know, at Whole Foods, uh, unless you're in a beta or whatever. But this is, this is the thing. Uh, this is a point of existential vulnerability. And there are really only two ways to get around this. Um, fundamentally, you can either... Uh, structure the system in such a way that you've encouraged enough adoption that now you can spend directly on groceries and, and the grocery store doesn't have time to take your blood sample or your passport. Um, or you can structure the system in such a way that the user cannot prove the provenance of their funds beyond the last transaction, right? Uh, and when we have these sort of uh, ageless transactions where, where you've got one or none, you can go, look, I got this from here. Right? and I could have rebalanced my wallet or whatever, and there's no way to show it back beyond that. Um, that's the only way to do it. We need users uh, to have a plausible explanation uh, that they cannot go around, right? There's a lot of uh, developers that are going, oh, we'll have selective transparency. Uh, selective transparency that's not driven by the user and that creates user-facing harms is a problem. Uh, the, actually, there's one more way to go around this, and hopefully we'll get people in the room who are working on this. And this is to go and just completely obsolete the whole market. And the way this works is all of these on-ramps and off-ramps today are driven by uh, basically contact with banks. Anywhere where governments are going, we have to license you to do monetary transactions. And right now, everybody in the space is still going, look, we're incorporated in Texas or San Francisco, or God forbid, the state of New York. Uh, and because of this, uh, we can only do these this certain way. And if, you know, we have these new FATCA regulations or if we have something from the New York uh, Attorney General or anything like that, uh, we're screwed. We have no defense. We have no recourse. We have to reincorporate, right? And we still live in the U.S. It's a problem. This is actually something that governments count on wherever their jurisdiction is, so long as they have this set of rules. What we don't see happening in the crypto space now, which is honestly unforgivable given how many new sort of millionaires and billionaires we have, 
is you guys need to start lobbying for more favorable jurisdictions, right? Um, and the whole point of this is just that they won't interfere with your business when it's working internationally. It doesn't matter uh, if you're doing transactions in the United States or in France or Germany or anywhere else, uh, unless you're in this model that we've always had, where you're trying to be the next you know, uh, Bank of America. You're trying to be the next uh, first national. But the world isn't waiting for the next first national. What the world needs is the first post-national, right? You need an entirely digital presence. <laughs> no, but this is a real thing. So long as you, know, you have uh, people and desks and machines that they can put their hands on, right? Um, and you're not distributing them through new routing layers, where it's difficult to tell uh, using mix nets and things like Core. Uh, where the communications are originating, where they're ending. Um, and we don't bake this in in a way that the user doesn't have to care about. It's invisible to them, right? They just open an app and it works. Uh, there's always going to be that point of pressure. And so long as the state you know, maintains a monopoly on the use of violence, it is always going to be applied in, in these ways. And I think a lot of people in this room understand that, right? But so long as we don't change and we play by the rules because we go, it's uncomfortable, I don't want to do this, and I believe very strongly that uh, Eric and Shape Shift Cruz didn't want to do this, uh, but they felt compelled to do this, right? The thing is, what have these guys done since? And this is not to pick on them, right? They're just the famous name uh, in this space. What's next? How do you respond, right? If the response is just to go, okay, we lost, you win, we're gonna keep filing our taxes and you know, going on with our lives. Uh, this is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> so I, I wanna ask you about what I think is maybe one of the strangest incidents uh, to occur in Bitcoin since I've been involved, uh, which was the shadow broker incident where uh, someone gained access to really, I guess, some of the most advanced uh, 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 technology out there, tried to auction it off for Bitcoin. It has to be the worst auction I've ever seen executed because I don't think they had any Bitcoin come in. But do you have any, any context for that? And then can you also speak to you know, how these, these technologies are being used um, for ransomware and, and you know, what implications that has for just cybersecurity and OPSEC in, in general? Right, so no, this is a great question. Uh, and I, I know it's uncomfortable for a lot of people in the audience, right? Uh, because this gets back to the bad things that are done with Bitcoin. Um, and again, every technology is going to be abused. Uh, the thing that we need to focus on is the frequency, right? Um, and, and the level of damage uh, that's occurred from it. And how do we mitigate that in a responsible way that still rights respect, right? And the way I look at this is, yeah, so for those who aren't familiar, the Shadow Brokers um, incident was uh, basically the NSA, which is supposed to have the most advanced security in the world, right? These are supposed to be the world's best hackers. They're spying on you. They're spying on everyone else. Um, they got pants. And some group that remains unknown to this day uh, stole basically a, a arsenal of their sort of um, digital weapons, right? Their, their hacking tools that they use for espionage. Um, and then they just put them on the internet. And they were like, hey, you want to pay us for it? We'll, we'll give you some extra, we'll give you some new tools, things we didn't uh, publish, things we didn't share, whatever. Um, and the NSA, the FBI, the combined might of the US government has never found these people, uh, to our knowledge, right? Um, and they, they kind of run, run, rode off into the sunset. But here's the thing, the problems didn't stop after that. Uh, the things that they published just openly, that they gave away for free, ended up being used uh, then in ransomware attacks uh, that went all over the world. And so the way this worked is the NSA created digital weapons. They couldn't control them, right? And I, what I want you to think about here in the context is governments around the world are hacking, right? Uh, Luxembourg is hacking people. Um, and if the NSA can't keep their hacking tools safe, you know, what are the odds Saudi Arabia is gonna be able to do the same? Uh, so now we have all of these governments that are attacking people, attacking people, attacking people with these extraordinary capabilities that they cannot keep safe. They eventually get stolen, they eventually get sold, they eventually get leaked, they eventually get ransomed, and then they get used to ransom the rest of us, because now they're just openly in the hands of criminals, right? Uh, and recently we had the government of Baltimore 
uh, that had the whole city shut down basically because their systems got locked and unless you paid a Bitcoin ransom, right? Uh, they, they weren't getting back in and these guys just didn't do a great job on their IT. They didn't have backups. Um, I think I just read that the city in Florida had similar problems. Uh, it hit uh, one of the world's largest shipping companies. It hit uh, hospitals. It hit all kinds of things, right? So the NSA, step after step after step after step, uh, ended up screwing our own critical infrastructure. But everybody keys on this point that Bitcoin was being used to ask for payment, right? Um, and sure, okay, maybe it was. Uh, they, it, it doesn't really matter because I don't believe that was the motivation of these attackers. It seems clear that this was actually done uh, for a political effect, and I believe it's actually a state that's behind this, but, but we don't know. Um, the bottom line is this, all right, uh, these bad guys have done this thing, these bad guys are using ransomware that are not on this level of sophistication, they're not state-backed, they're just, you know, kids in basements and ordinary, you know, uh, dime store criminals. How do you deal with them? And this is a much longer conversation that gets very complex. Um, but if tracking Bitcoin transactions were effective, the shadow brokers would be in jail. Because it, it's important to understand uh, there are uh, altcoins out there, privacy coins, that wouldn't have this same transaction trail, right? And then you just shift it into a Monero or a Zcash or, you know, they've got the new ones like Green Beam and these other things David Child is working on called Elixir. And then you shift it back into the chain onto the Bitcoin blockchain if you've got none of that history, right? And nobody even sees this kind of thing happen. Um, but these guys didn't do that as, as far as we understand, or maybe they did, it doesn't matter. But there's a thousand ransomware attacks where we can look at where they didn't do this. And they just did it naked on the Bitcoin ledger, uh, which is completely open to the public. Um, and then what, right? Uh, it's out there, Bitcoin's worth a, a million billion dollars, you know, whatever it is today. <laughs> Um, and whether they're spending it or not, we don't see these guys getting jailed. And the reason why is I know this quite well from my personal experience. You can have the most powerful tools of surveillance in the world, and they're not going to solve all your problems. They're not even going to solve many of your problems. They're going to solve a very few of your problems. And this is the thing, you know, people think about mass surveillance. They think about all this blockchain analysis. They think about um, basically uh, de-anonymizing people as a public safety measure. Because this is how the government always argues it. You know, they go, uh, if you don't give us this extraordinary power, if you don't give us this new counterterrorism legislation, if you don't give us this anti-money laundering law, uh, your children are going to die. You know, the, the Iranians are going to be camped out in the White House lawn, right? Uh, the, the oceans are going to boil off. The atmosphere is going to catch on fire. Uh, it, it's the end of the world. Because that's the emotionally simple argument. And sad to say, it works. And it has worked and it will continue to work until we as people change and grow up. That's not gonna happen anytime soon. Um, but the, the thing here is this, uh, these surveillance programs, when we look at in the case of mass surveillance in 2013, right? this is the deepest look that the public has ever gotten into how these programs actually operate, who they're targeted against, where they're effective, where they're not effective. Um, President Obama himself, right? Uh, who came out and criticized me so strongly in June of 2013, by January of 2014, said, this conversation made us stronger as a nation, although he could never condone what I did, right? Fair enough. Uh, I'm not asking for permission. Uh, <laughs> as you can, as you can tell, Edward, you have a lot of fans here. <laughs> Here's the thing on that. To his credit, uh, what happened between 2013 and 2014 was he appointed two different independent commissions, you know, independent in the context of government. Uh, and these were filled with all his friends, right, people who were supposed to look at all the evidence. They had complete access to classified information. They could go to the director of the FBI, the NSA, the CIA, go, uh, where were these programs used? Uh, how did they help us? You know, are they saving lives? Because we're taking a lot of heat for this. And we want to know if we should ditch this program or not. Uh, if, if we can just give this up and life will go on. And uh, when we first got into 2013, all these agencies leapt out of their chairs and said, these journalists who publish these stories, uh, they're going to have blood on their hands, right? People are going to die. Uh, the same thing we do always here. But then once these guys, these uh, 
committees uh, dug in. It was the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board and the President's Review Group on Intelligence and Communications Technologies. Uh, after they did their investigations, they found that while uh, they had said initially, the government had said initially, these things have been used in all of these different ways, and they thwarted all of these plots. Uh, the very first program that I ever uh, worked with journalists to reveal, uh, which was Section 215 of the Patriot Act, this is where the United States government was collecting the phone records of everyone in the United States. Uh, it didn't matter if you were suspected of any crime or not. Your grandma was in there, right? Um, and they were just doing it because they there had been a law, uh, a section of the Patriot Act, that said the government had the authority to collect any records that it considered relevant to a uh, counterterrorism investigation, right? And they considered every phone record in the United States relevant to this. Now, they didn't tell us at the time. We didn't learn for many years about this, and this was unconstitutional in my opinion. And, uh, illegal and likely unconstitutional in the opinion of at least uh, one federal court. Um, but the, the thing here is, is this, when they dug into it, the findings of the committee was this program had never stopped even a single terrorist attack in the United States. They said, in fact, it had not even been helpful, uh, or it, sorry, it had not even made, a, these are their words, a concrete difference in a single counterterrorism investigation. Because by the time the government had enough to look at you, you know, on the stage or you in the audience and go, um, you know, we think this guy's up to no good. Here's his name. Here's his phone number. Here's his email to put in these databases to pull him out because we've got everybody in the world in there. Um, they have enough to go through the old traditional mechanisms of law enforcement that we know work to go. Uh, to a judge and say, we think this person's up to no good, sign a warrant, and then we'll go wiretap that person individually. We'll tap their phone specifically. We'll go into their house. You know, we'll plant a surveillance device. Uh, we'll hack their computer, whatever. Targeted rather than mass surveillance, right? And we know that targeted surveillance has worked in the past. But this is the funny thing about that Shutterworker story, right? And the whole Bitcoin, you know, is the enemy uh, narrative that we see in the world today. The Shutterworkers didn't get caught. No matter the fact that you know Bitcoin and these cryptocurrencies are so open and they are uh, so trackable today, um, because mass surveillance isn't enough. Mass surveillance isn't about public safety. It's about power. It's about social uh, influence. Uh, it's about um, diplomatic, you know, uh, sort of espionage. And it's about seeing what everyone is doing because that information or intelligence, as they call it, allows you to understand, not you know, the hardest of your hard targets, because bin Laden stopped using a cell phone in 1998, um, but to understand what ordinary people are doing, because there is value in that. And the government, look, right or wrong, might say, we want to be able to do that. It's useful to the government to see what everybody's doing, to see how they're trading, and to go, we want to either authorize this or not authorize this. We want to interfere here or we don't want to interfere here. We want to see what's happening in the country or the world. That's a conversation in a democracy that they could have, and they could put that to a vote, but they don't want to because they are afraid the answer is not the same as it is when they say, do you want to give us this? Because if you don't, your children will die. If we have a more complex, nuanced conversation, we get different and better answers, right? But as you asked today, what does this mean? Uh, it means mass surveillance is never going to solve our problems, but it will make our lives worse. So, so Edward, we're, we're out of time, but this is also uh, our conference, so we can break the rules a little bit. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I have just two, two more questions and, and we'll, we'll wrap it up. So the next question, you know, in this day and age, it seems like no one has any privacy. How is it possible that we still have no idea who Satoshi is? And what does that tell us about Satoshi? You know, this is, um, this is one of the most interesting parts of the Bitcoin story, which is why we're still talking about it all these years later. Uh, and the thing that I love about it is the story that it tells us OPSEC works, right? Operational security. If you're careful, if you learn how the system works, 
uh, better than the people who are exploiting it to harm you, better than the people who built it, right? Um, you can use it in ways that actually work to your advantage, even though you don't own it, right? Um, and Satoshi Nakamoto, right, he, he may have written the paper, he may have laid the groundwork, he may have given us, in a real way, the Bitcoin system, peer-to-peer <laughs> -peer electronic cash system that it is. Um, but uh, he did not create the internet, or they did not create the internet, all of these other systems. But they took the time to understand them well enough that despite uh, all of the time that they were engaged in it, despite all the way they were communicating it, despite all the time they were creating on it, and despite all of the interest and all of the honestly unimaginable and unpredictable level of resources that were applied to them years later. And the thing about OPSEC is if you make one mistake once early on and the internet never forgets, that mistake never goes away. Uh, you still can have privacy. Right? And this is the problem. Right now we live in a world where privacy is for the professional. It's for the expert, it's for the rich, it's for the elite, it is for the privileged. But we can't live in a free world where privacy is a privilege. Privacy has to be a right. It has to be accessible to everyone if it's going to actually matter. So one more question for you. This is perhaps the most important question. Is Edward Snowden a Bitcoin holdler? So, as a privacy advocate, uh, I would encourage anyone, if they're ever asked, <laughs> to deny having any cryptocurrency whatsoever. <laughs> but I, I will say this, I will say this. Uh, the story of uh, 2013, right? And it's, you know, there's a lot of nuance we don't have time to discuss here because it's not about this, but, you know, people think I published stuff in 2013. They, they think I told the truth and everybody knew all that stuff. But that's not actually how it worked. I gathered evidence of what I believe to be criminal or unconstitutional or simply just rights violating behavior by the government. And I took the evidence of that and I gave it to the journalists because I wanted them to take my political biases and my strong feelings out of the equation. And they got this information on the condition that they published no story because it was interesting or no story because it was news, but only published stories that they were willing to stake their reputation on the fact that it was in the public interest to know these things, right? Um, and really, the, the rest is history, right? They, they got the story out, uh, and the world knew how these systems worked a little bit better. It doesn't have to you know, change the world. I didn't set out to change the world. I just wanted people to understand what their government was doing, both in their name and against them, right? Um, but it has caused a lot of good uh, for the world, I believe. Uh, I was once accused uh, in the aftermath by the uh, US government's most senior intelligence official, uh, then General James Clapper, the director of national intelligence. Uh, he said, for pulling forward the adoption of commercial cryptography uh, by seven years. And he meant this is a very terrible thing. Like it was the worst thing that was the moment. That's the nicest thing anyone ever said about it. Here's, here's the thing in my, in my uh, why it relates. Uh, well, I won't say whether I have Bitcoin or anything else, right? Um, the servers that I used to transfer this information to journalists, because I didn't want these records connected to my name when I understood how the system of mass surveillance worked, uh, they were paid for using Bitcoin. So, hey, Bitcoin had a part of it. So uh, uh, I'm not sure if Edward Snowden can see this, but can we give a huge round of applause for a freedom fighter? Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> Best of luck with the rest of the events. Thank you. Have a good day. Stay free.